Well, it's October, my favorite month. So I think it's fitting that I do a horror game, one that's fairly niche and one that's been sitting in my GOG library for quite a while now, with only about two hours of playtime. Legacy, Realm of Terror. Released in 1993 in America and 1992 in Europe, Realm of Terror was published by Microprose, a company that's actually still around, with one of their founders being the famous Sid Myers, who was best known for the Civilization and Pirate series, with the latter being some of my favorite games. The Legacy wasn't developed by Sid Myers, of course. It was developed by Magnetic Scrolls, with the Legacy being their last game, it looks like. Realm of Terror is definitely a horror game, but the way it plays is actually like a dungeon hack and Eye of the Beholder. Basically a dungeon crawler, or to be more accurate, a mansion crawler, which is a very interesting concept. The game doesn't seem to have taken off though, as I'd never heard of the Legacy until it came out on GOG storefront by Pico. I only had about two hours of playtime into the game because I made the mistake of just jumping right in before reading the manual. Because this game is difficult. Brutally difficult. Even the manual warns you that it's your funeral if you jump straight in like I did. Whoops. Seriously though, I wasn't sure if I could finish this game, so I figured I'd play maybe for 10-20 hours, explore, try some new characters, and then make a video about it. But thanks to the manual, game FAQ maps, a let's play, as well as a ridiculous amount of save scumming, I actually managed to finish it in about 12 hours, with the only warrior potentially softlocking myself because I chose the wrong skill or magic setup or something. Before we dive into the game though, you have to choose one of eight characters, all with their own little backstory in the newspaper, as well as a choice of redesigning their skills and attributes. You can rename them as well if you want to, but for some reason you don't see their names in game, so it's kind of pointless. The characters range anywhere from two college kids, a stage magician, a marine, history professor, a widow, lawyer, and a journalist. The story of the game is that one of these characters inherits a mansion called House Winthrop from long lost relatives in New England. Wow, sounds like it's almost too good to be true. That's because it is, because as soon as you enter, you're locked inside with zombies, skeletons, ghouls, ghosts, and horrors beyond mortal comprehension, as well as a voice that laughs at you every time you try to leave. <laughs> And apparently the mansion itself is the house that the developers were inspired by in Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Fall of the House of Usher. Turns out Poe had an experience at some New England house which inspired him to write a story about it. It's not a story I've read personally, nor any of his works or anything. It's all in the manual towards the very end. As far as which character I chose, I went with this Tim Curry looking guy, the stage magician, who was apparently involved in some sort of sacrifice scandal according to his newspaper article. Magic is pretty important, I read, but other than that, I managed to finish this game without having to redesign this character. But as far as the gameplay goes, well, what you see is what you get. The gameplay is like a dungeon crawler for its time, as I said earlier, and you're better off running away from most enemies. In fact, even the manual encourages you to do so. You don't get experience from them, so I'd only fight them if you're really confident you can do so without losing too much health, as first aid kits and magic points are unlimited supply. Honestly, this game kind of reminds me of Resident Evil in a way. The mansion setting, the main hall, the limited inventory space, lack of supplies, choosing what to keep and what to drop and such. And yes, I know Resident Evil came out after this game. I'm a huge Resident Evil fan, which is likely why I got reminded of all this stuff. But other than that, Roma Terra is extremely obtuse in direction and puzzle design, which is definitely par for the course for games back then, but on top of that, the monsters in this game hit like a truck, especially in the earlier sections. Until I got some better weapons and armor, I ended up having to save scum so I didn't lose too much health. My strategy was to basically lure them in empty rooms so I didn't run across them all the time. And this may be a slight spoiler, but before I streamed this game, I came across this item on the first floor which prevents the undead from attacking you. Very helpful, especially since the first floor is filled with zombies. I did come by and slay them afterwards, and that's when I found out that you don't gain experience from killing monsters, which is a shame. Better to go for the Resident Evil approach and kill enemies if you run across them while backtracking or something. Considering the age of the game, I was curious as to how it controls nowadays. Well, I'm happy to report that the Legacy, despite being a game from 93, has WASD movements with Q and E letting you turn side to side. I didn't really have a problem with the gameplay mechanics. One thing I struggled with a little was dragging and dropping items. It's a little finicky. Sometimes it seemed like I was able to pick up an item, but you have to place the mouse cursor almost exactly how the game wants you to, which is slightly annoying. You can use the get command for ease of use, but I'm one of those players that wants to place the item exactly where I want it to be. You can resize and move around the in-game panels too if you want to, but I left them as they are. 
The game also has an auto map feature, but unlike say Ultimate Underworld 1 and 2, you can't write notes on it. Which is an absolute shame because the map doesn't mark stairs and such, so even with the map, I struggle to figure out where to backtrack to at times. The game FAQ maps were a godsend in backtracking, as well as this Let's Play. I'll put both of those in the description. The Let's Play is a fun read from what I refer to. And again, the game is old, so the combat might be its weakest point for some people. Just equip any melee or firearm or whatever hand and hope for the best. And it's a good time to mention the blue bar on the bottom of the paper doll. That's your max accuracy. Maxed out gives you a better chance to hit, and a higher skill helps out too, of course. I went melee for this playthrough, and some of the weapons aren't really clear as to which skill it uses. For example, check out this fire axe. You'd think it'd be the blade skill, right? Well, apparently not. It's considered a blunt weapon, or in this game's case, a club weapon. At least according to the Let's Play I referred to. I figured the low accuracy was due to the axe itself, and less on my blade skill. Or it could be a bug. You never know with a game like this. But I'm glad I went melee for this playthrough as inventory space is precious in this game. You only get 4 slots to start off with, and an attaché case in a room next to the main hall, which holds 14 slots. Sounds like a lot, but it'll fill up quickly, believe me. And also, attaché case? Hey, Resident Evil 4. Alright, moving on. Here's another thing I like. You can carry practically anything in any hand. Thought that was a nice little detail. I also like how the switch moves in the on position when you use the flashlight. Another nice little detail. Honestly, the art direction and monster designs is one of the things this game really excels at. The developers were really all in in making the monsters and environments as terrifying as possible. The developers mentioned if anyone commented on how good a monster or room was, they would redo it until someone said they looked horrible and terrifying. Now that's dedication. On top of that, your character also loses their sanity as he or she is facing off against these Lovecraftian monstrosities. A commenter mentioned that this mechanic is bugged, but the way it's supposed to work is that your character is more likely to panic and run away for a short period of time. But if you defeat a monster, that increases your reason level. Which makes sense, as Tim Curry here is pretty fearless towards the end of the game. Aside from weapons and such, you also get spells in this game. And as I said before, they're necessary, and even the manual says you won't get far without them. All the spells have interesting names and descriptions, with one of them letting you see in the dark, and another lets you open up locked doors, which is very helpful. But the reason why it's necessary is that some enemies can only be hurt through the use of magic. But I try to use these sparingly, as the only way to regenerate magic points is through the use of crystals. And like everything else, they're in limited supply. And I'll get to the story bits in a minute, I want to talk about the music. It's not good. Well, it's good in some sections, just not this one. I'm using the basic music and sound effects for this playthrough, as there's no simple way to get Roland MT32 to work. You can't access the DOS installation through Galaxy like with Underworld 1 and 2, for example. You have to access it straight through DOSBox. I did manage to get it working while putting the video together, but the music was way too quiet and the sound effects too loud, with the laughter sound effect back at the front door completely disappearing for some reason. You also need a program to get it working as well, but other than that, the music sounded pretty good while I was listening to it, and it's likely I did something wrong as well. There's only a few posts on GOG and Steam that I worked with, so I decided to just not mess with it in depth for streaming as I wanted to get this horror video out before October ends. But I do find the game compelling enough to get the best experience as I do see myself replaying it one day. In fact, I did another playthrough as I was working on getting my thoughts outlined, so this game is doing something right. Continuing with the gameplay though, well, it's a DOS game from 93. The developers actually considered making this a party based game but decided against it with this being a horror game and all. The quest design is something else too. You come across various notes, books, and NPCs throughout the game and while some of them are fairly clear as to what your next task should be, others are fairly vague. One of the puzzles later in the game, which gives you an item that is required for finishing it, was a little finicky. I tried clicking on it and clicking on it and the item just wouldn't drop. In fact, I wasn't even sure you were supposed to get an item until I consulted a let's play. A note you get states that you should take an item to this room, but doesn't mention that you need another item in order to complete the puzzle, nor does it mention that you even get an item. It didn't work eventually, so I guess I just wasn't clicking on the right spot or something. 
Not to mention that to find the final boss in the final area is not very obvious. Trying to play this game without any sort of guide is definitely a trial. On par with any Ultima game, I'm thinking. Anyways, past this point, there's going to be spoilers for the story and areas, so skip here if you don't want that. I know the game is pretty old, but just in case. As I said earlier, one of eight characters inherits House Winthrop from long lost relatives. The meat of the story is that basically, your ancestors, the Winthrops, and two Lovecraftian gods are trying to free Belthegor, who ends up being the final boss of the game. A lot of the story is uncovered through various notes, books, as well as some NPCs you encounter. The mansion itself has nine floors, four of them being the basement levels, and the upper floors housing the asylum, museum, and an Egyptian tomb. Great places to go to in a horror game. There's also a really nice looking area called the Ethereal Plane, which lets you traverse quickly to another level if you can navigate your way through all this. And the last area is the Astral Plane, where the final boss resides. Going back to the Egyptian tomb though, you find out here that there's a being called Karsis who is actually one of your ancestors. The very same ancestor you see burning in a painting in the main hall. Turns out he's been pulling strings to get his descendants to perform sick rites and sacrificing inmates through his pact with the dark god Belthegor. You need five Chinese coins one of his servants tricked you into getting, but if you have his heart, he gets really scared and tries to say his dark god tricked him. If you give it to him, he'll give you the secret into defeating Belthegor so naturally I ignored him and destroyed his heart. I reloaded just to see what happens, and yeah, he was lying, go figure. It just puts you in a boss fight. Way before you encounter him though, you find out that a woman named Ellen, an inmate from the asylum, murdered her brother, Robert Prentice, both relatives of yours. Turns out that despite being crazy, she understands all the evil going on in the mansion and is doing her best to purge it without acts of hers. Unfortunately, she also knows you're the heir, so she tries to kill you too. There's other NPCs as well, like this man you meet in the ethereal plane who gives you a very powerful spell that I used to beat the final boss with, plus some really cool looking glasses. As well as this lady who just sort of walks in the same hallway over and over on the second floor. From what I read, she's considered an illusion to trick you into walking to these traps that drain your health, which makes sense as you can't talk to her. The real her is found behind a door that you can access through a puzzle on that same floor. She basically says that she was hired to investigate the disappearance of the Prentice family, and then she leaves. If you choose the right dialogue options here, she mentions that the demons and ghosts on the second floor can be instantly killed with holy water, which is a very helpful tip for a first playthrough. Another NPC I have to mention is the servant, the one who tricked you into getting those five Chinese coins. He mentioned he's related to you, but if you check the family tree, you find that his name is not even on there. I love it when games do this kind of thing. You can even check the family tree in the game's manual if you happen to miss the in-game notes somehow. But anyways, he's pretty much working for a car system Belthegor and even encourages you to not resist the monsters and just let yourself die. Yeah, no. There's also another character you read about who is trying to put an end to all this madness, but you never run across him. Unfortunately, he likely died as his last note mentioned that he tried to rush a figure in the mausoleum. To be honest, I missed out on quite a few things as I was playing. Go figure since it was my first time diving into this. For example, there's three statues you can find, and if you put them on pedestals in a certain room in the museum, blow them up, it'll eliminate all the creatures on that level except for these green ooze things. There's honestly a few situations where you can outright eliminate most enemies on certain floors. Zombies on the first floor are easily avoided with a fetish item, and ghosts on the second floor disappear if you burn their painting. After that, you pretty much have all the holy water you need to instantly kill the flying demons there. These squid things can be easily avoided too if you dress up as them, but honestly, my second playthrough was a lot easier after knowing the placement of items and such. Which makes sense of course, the first playthrough is always going to be a tense experience, and is honestly one of the fun things about this game. Going back to those two gods I mentioned earlier, the ones who are trying to free Belthegor, their names are Melchior and Alberoth. Melchior is this floating jellyfish thing, and Alberoth is this thing in the third floor basement. You can't fight him however, you have to force him to leave Earth somehow through the use of a telescope and an item. If you don't do this, you basically can't explore the third floor basement, as he's completely impassable unlike other enemies. It's a good idea to put a few points into dodge in any playthrough, otherwise you won't be able to move past the monsters. So okay, let me try to remember what's required to defeat the final boss. You need to find the Golden Torque of Gothua, which is found in the mausoleum, slay Karsist, Find the meteorite from the Fishman Caves, do that very vague puzzle I mentioned earlier in order to get the Eye of Agla, then venture into the Astral Plane either through the Ethereal Plane, or jump out of the caves and into the water. 
A note mentions that as a possible entrance, I believe. Then you wander around the maze aimlessly like I did, hoping to find the final boss until you give up, look up a let's play, only to find out that Belthegor is behind a secret wall. Then it's time for an epic encounter. Okay, so it's not very epic. Fun fact is that Belthegor is immune to all forms of physical damage, so if you don't have magical spells or you're completely out of magic points, you're pretty much done here. I didn't even get a good look at Belthegor as my eyes were constantly glancing between my health and magical spells. He hits very hard, but luckily I was able to finish him off in one go. After slaying the Dark God himself, you're treated to a short ending of the mansion being destroyed with a newspaper article stating that your character went on a world cruise. Well, he didn't get his mansion, but at least he's alive. But anyways, I like this game a lot. I give it 7 skulls out of 10, but do I recommend it? Well, I believe it's niche for a reason, so I wouldn't get this game just because you think it's a dungeon hack or an eye of the beholder kind of game. I mean, it plays like it, but it's focused on the horror experience than a D&D adventure. As I said earlier, it's really heavy on the save load aspect with very obtuse quest design. Even with the clues you gather from notes, they're rather vague at times and you'll be left wandering around the mansion with a question mark above your head like I did. That's par for the course for a game like this, but if you could push through it, there's a lot to love here. Namely with the art, visuals, and monster designs. Big bonus if you happen to love the Cthulhu Mythos, of course, as this game is heavily inspired by that kind of thing. Combining horror with dungeon crawling to create something like this is a very interesting idea. It's just too bad it didn't take off. Personally, I ended up replaying it for a little while while working on this video, and I'll likely end up playing it again one day. If you do decide to buy it, just be sure to set the CPU cycles to max, otherwise saving and loading will be painful. It also crashed on me a few times, likely due to that. In the meantime, be wary of any emails or calls saying you've inherited a mansion, and thanks for watching.